couple of weeks ago, uh, I have a two-car garage um, when I came here. You know, I, I, was, I was actually driving here 12 years ago from California uh, when we moved here 12 years ago. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, w- so I, when I sold my house in California uh, and downsized because I couldn't afford a five-bedroom, three-bath here with RV parking because uh, what a house costs cost here. So I had to have at least a two-car garage. So I got a two-car garage because I'm a car guy. I'll admit it. I like it clean, squared away. Uh, and so I, I don't like my cars left in the driveway. Do you? Oh, only two people identify me. The rest of you are like, who cares? What's it matter? It matters greatly. Uh, it's the first question from St. Peter at the gate, you know. <laughs> How was your car? You know. Uh, but all joking aside, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I am on the right side of the garage when you're looking at the house. My wife's on the left-hand side of the garage. Uh, she told me, say, hey, honey, my, my side is kind of acting funny. You know, it's not, it's not going down like normal. And so could you take a look at it? So what's a man to do? All right, an excuse to rip out my tools, and et cetera. So uh, I got the ladder out, put it up to, you know, the, to the unit. And it's, I have an old unit, a Craftsman model on my side that's been there probably since Jesus walked the planet. This thing is a tank. It's, it's never going to disintegrate. Hers is I, it's about a year and a half old. And I've already replaced one major component of it by warranty before. And, and so I'm like, what is up with this new unit? Uh, and so I got up there. I got the ladder. Uh, I got the instruction manual. Yeah, yeah. The bear in mind, I grew up with a father who never looked at the instruction manual. He'd always tell my mom, Sue, I don't need one of those. I'm a man. <laughs> well, that's why you need the instruction manual. You need to read it. So I learned a long time ago, uh, you probably need to read that instruction manual. So I climbed up there, read the manual, uh, and did all the things you're supposed to do to, to make it work. It would go down like 20% and pop back up. I mean, no matter what I did. And so I finally gave up the ghost, uh, and I called the 1-800 number. I always love calling those numbers. So I called, I got this really nice lady in Tucson, and I was talking to her, and I was on the phone with her for, I don't know, 45 minutes. She was running different diagnostic tests and things like that, and we'd have to wait a few seconds for things to run. And so we're just, you know, small talk, talking to her, and, and I said, oh, you're in, where are you? She goes, I'm in Tucson. I go, oh, awesome. I used to live in Tucson. Oh, yeah. Like, What'd you do here? What'd you do when you were in Tucson? Oh, I was a youth pastor in a retirement community. Huh? <laughs> You know, you know, south of Tucson is Green Valley where I started out. Oh, you're a pastor. Yeah. Where are you now? I'm in D.C. I'm a pastor at a church. She's like, here we are doing all these diagnostic tests. She's like, could you, could you pray for me? I'm like, well, yeah, for forty nine ninety five. And no, I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I was just smarty humor. No, I said, absolutely, I'd pray for you. What do you need, need, need me to pray for? She goes, well, you know, I've been married, you know, 28 years and Things are tough sometimes, they're great sometimes, and I just need you to pray for me and my husband. So, what's his name? Okay, so I wrote it down on the instruction manual, you know, and, and then she goes, and yeah, and, and, and I told her, I'm in the military church, basically. I know a lot of Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, etc. Did I miss anybody? Yeah, I've learned. Uh, and and, and she, uh, she said, well, my daughter just joined the U.S. Army, and uh, she's going to uh, boot camp, Fort Benning. Yeah. And she goes, uh, it's going to be good for her. And I said, absolutely, it will. Because I said, we got a lot of great army in our church. And there's great men and women. And it would be great for her. So I'll pray for her too. What's her name? And what's the diagnostic test I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> so, so I'm talking to her and everything. Having a great time, you know, just talking to her. And, uh, and uh, so she, she finally gives me the, the old, I'm going somewhere with this in case you're wondering. <laughs> I don't meander. Do I meander? No, no. I, always, I have a purpose. Remember I told you everything in life has a spiritual value if you pay attention, even your garage door malfunctioning. And so uh, after it became readily apparent what was the matter, she explained it to me. She said, look, sir, uh, in, inside your unit uh, is, you know, the main motor uh, that drives the chain and everything. And she said, attached to that is a, m- a travel module. It's a little plastic piece uh, wrapped around the gear mechanism. And that, that's gone, so it won't send the unit down. So you need a travel mechanism. So my ne- next logical question is, is that under warranty? Isn't that the next logical question? Right. And she goes, yeah, yeah, it's under warranty. You're in luck. Uh, but it's attached to the motor. Um, I see where this is going. It's attached to the motor. Uh, and you have to get both of them at the same time because they're, 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 they're made together, you know, kind of. Like, so you need, you, you need to pay for the motor and the travel module's for free. <laughs> you know, some engineer sits around and figures this stuff out. We'll totally nail him here. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I'm talking to her, and I'm like, okay, if that's what I got to do. But she goes, you know what? Um, you know, she goes, because I, I, I asked her, I said, do you have a magic wand? 
she started laughing. I go, you know, kind of wave it over this unit. She goes, no, I don't have a magic wand, but I do have the ability to grant you a free motor. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so she said, I'll tell you what. She said, I'm going to write on here, free motor, free travel module. I'm going to send that to you. How do you feel about that? I'm like, awesome. It's awesome. So I'll pray for you. You send me the free motor. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so the motor came with the travel module. I'm thinking to myself, how hard can this be? Yeah, so last weekend, you know, I'm getting ready to go with the men's retreat. It's Friday morning. My wife, my marriage is on the line. She doesn't want her car in the driveway. And so it's like, honey, I'll get up Monday, Friday morning before I go to the men's retreat at noon. I mean, how long can this take, you know? And I, yeah, I read the directions before I went outside. I'm like, I'm not even going to attempt it. I have to disassemble the entire unit. So I'll wait. So Monday when I got back, uh, I had a friend uh, help me. And we set up a work table and got out the sockets and the drill, everything we needed to take this thing apart. And we had to take the entire unit apart. Everything. The whole thing. I'm thinking, why didn't I just buy a new one? But we took the whole thing apart. Wires unplugged here and there. Bolts here and there. And weird bolts you can't really get to. Special tool to get in there. I mean, it was unbelievable. Got the whole thing apart. Keeping track of all the different screws. And I'm reading the directions. You know, number one, turn off the electricity. No kidding. Number two, get a ladder. Yeah, yeah. All the directions. So I get down to the end of the directions. I got everything apart. And this is what it says. <laughs> to install the motor and the travel module, repeat all the other steps in reverse. I mean, that took a rocket scientist to figure that one out. So I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I'm going to be here forever. And so we follow the directions. Okay, number eight, number seven, number six, number five. You know, do we miss anything? And so we made sure we got everything done before we sealed it up and put it back up with the chain and everything. And that thing is working prima now. Praise God. But what's that got to do with spirituality? You have no idea? <laughs> I do. Because the whole time I'm working on it, I'm thinking this is a spiritual lesson. What's the lesson? In order to move from dysfunctionality to functionality, I had to follow the practical instruction guide. Hmm. What's the Bible? It is a practical... Are you following me on this or am I totally lost? It's so abstract, I had no idea what he's talking about. No. The Bible is a practical instruction guide for godly living, for functional living. So when you become a Christian, you're highly dysfunctional. You think you're functional, but you're highly dysfunctional. And you find out there's a lot in my life that's dysfunctional, sinful. So what is Christianity? Spirituality. It's all about growing up in the faith and moving away from dysfunction to function. And so Paul has got a manual for us to help fix your motor and travel module of your own spiritual life that's not functioning well. And he, he in chapter 12, is giving you exact advice, practical advice, that if you follow this, you move from dysfunction to function, or you move from immaturity to maturity. What has he said? Well, we're reviewing verses one and two. He said, um, if you are saved by God's grace in your belief in Christ as the Messiah, then you should be moving to transform your mind. Uh, the mind's the problem. And don't conform to the world. That's what he says in verses one and two. And then when he gets into verses nine and following, as we've seen in, in the instruction manual, he's clicked down through 11 things so far, 11 steps to move from dysfunction to function, from immaturity to Maturity. So how do I grow up in the faith? I follow the instruction guide. And that's what uh, those verses 9 through 13 are all about. There's 11 commandments listed there that if you, if you build them into your life, you achieve a place of maturity in Christ. Today we're going to look at uh, item number 12 uh, in his manual to grow up in the faith, to leave dysfunction and to grow up in the faith. And what do you have to do? It's a very interesting concept that he brings. It's kind of jaw-dropping, especially in the culture in which he lived, which is similar to the culture in which we live. Notice what he says here, you must do. Remember, follow the directions to grow up in the faith. Item number 12. What's he say? Be radically righteous toward who? People that you like. No. People that agree with you. No. People that are loving and caring and kind. No. Be radically righteous toward enemies of the faith. That's what he says. Bless those who do what? Persecute you. And then he adds, bless and do not be guilty of cursing them. That's as far as we're going. In fact, that's more than just one sermon. That could be an entire series. But we'll, we'll delve into this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Uh, the word that he use here, uses here for bless is a uh, present tense uh, verb, which means this is supposed to be your perpetual lifestyle. That this is the way you're always to be when people 
are oppose you for your faith. You're always supposed to be blessing them, not, not cursing them. I'll give you the Greek word uh, behind the, the English text, uh, and you will probably recognize this word um, when I give it to you. Euologeo. Does that sound familiar? When you go to a funeral, what does the pastor do regarding the deceased? He gives a eulogy. What is a eulogy? It's a eulogeo. It's a eulogy. Uh, what is a eulogy? You're saying nice things, great things about the person. Uh, really, if you look at the word lexically, what it means in Greek, it means to uh, call God's gracious power down upon somebody. Apply that to what Paul just said. Item uh, number 12 in the manual to move from dysfunction to function. If I'm supposed to reach my culture for Christ and be Christ to them, well, what am I supposed to do when my culture opposes me? Paul says, oh, it's simple. You are supposed to perpetually live in such a way that when they oppose your faith, you do not retaliate. You take that word, you will logeo, and you pray down God's blessing upon them. Mind-boggling, is that not? You ever been opposed for your faith? Uh, I have. I, I have been spit at, yelled at, cussed at. I've had things, I don't, substances shot at me through water-type guns at things I've been at. I mean, been there, done that. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you supposed to do? Uh, I was one time demonstrating uh, with my wife and kids for a pro-life movement in our town, uh, and not in this town, but out in California, uh, and we, the, all the thousands of Christians uh, lined the streets uh, for, for pro-life. We all had shirts on. And we're just standing there uh, to be promoting life that God gives, the unborn. Uh, and it's, I had my little kids with me and a car went by and they had some kind of squirt gun thing with red dye type in it. And so as they went by us, they shot me and my kids. And the window was down. And I'm on a corner and they have to slow down at the corner to go around the corner. I have options as a man. What's your carnal man want to do? Come on, be honest. Hallelujah, praise God for you. Mm -mm. Uh, the other side of me wants to go over to the car uh, and like reach into the car and say, hey, uh, hit, you know, hit the brake. We need to talk. <laughs> you know, now, what did Jesus say? What did Paul say? Well, it, when they persecute me for my faith and belief in Jesus and, and when they persecute me for my belief in high morality, etc., uh, I am not to retaliate. I am to, I am to verbally pray down God's blessing upon them. Interesting, is it not? Can you do that? Will you do that? How do you do that? The book of Zechariah, chapter four, verse six, kind of gives you an idea of where the power comes from you not to retaliate, because it's natural to retaliate. Uh, it says in uh, chapter four of Zechariah, verse six, uh, speaking uh, about Zerubbabel, you know, and the rebuilding of the temple after the fall of the temple in 586 BC with the Babylonians. Uh, now, you know, many, many years later, they're rebuilding the temple. Uh, how's this thing gonna be established? Well, God tells him, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how we're going to do all this. I, I can use you, Zerubbabel, as, as a great political leader, spiritual leader, but at, in his base form, you're going to do this amazing thing because my power is going to be behind you. So when you're in a situation where they want to curse you, yell at you, scream at you, they're vile, they're venomous, where does the power come to not retaliate? Well, it first and foremost comes from the spirit of God who resides in you. Uh, when I grew up on the Mexican border, because uh, my dad was the chief agent for uh, U.S. Customs, and then eventually went to be a, like a district director with ICE, uh, I grew up in that kind of world. But because I knew a lot of, uh, a lot of Hispanics, and I grew up in, on the border, I lived, I was born and raised there. Uh, I did all my preaching in Mexico as in, in high school. That's where I started, preaching in little villages. Uh, and one little village that we would go to quite often was called Cucapa Indigenas. That's where we'd go. And I was 16, 17 years old, and I would take friends from school to be my interpreters. Guys didn't even go to church. Hey, Enrique, what are you doing Sunday? Nothing, man. <laughs> come with me. And they would come. The first time I went down there, it was for an evening service, uh, and uh, I wasn't quite used to the culture of the village and stuff, and very poor people, very impoverished, mud, mud brick houses with, you know, like straw-type roofs, very poor. Uh, and I invited the whole village to come to church that night, and, uh, and they came, but no men came. The women came and the children came. I'm like, where are the men? They didn't come. Uh, after I preached, I led a, cr a children's story behind the stage uh, and then they did music and stuff on the stage. So I went around the back after I preached and I had a little room with all the children back there to teach them a Bible story uh, through a, f a friend of mine who was an interpreter. Uh, and I was noticing when I got back there that there was a wooden door there with a, a crossbar on it. I'm like, why does the church have a crossbar? You know, what, you know what I mean? Like to bar the door? I'm like, why does the church need one of those? I found out. 
Because as I started my children's story, all the men of the village were outside that door. And they weren't coming to greet me. It wasn't buenos noches. It was like they're trying to drag us out to beat us up. I was like 17 years old. They're beating on the door. I'm talking beating on the door. Crushing the door. I'm looking at that, that piece of two by four that's, that's barring the door. I'm thinking, praise God, that's on there to protect us inside the church from the raging mob outside that doesn't want us to be there. We were high school students. Supposed to fear in that situation? No. Because I shouldn't fear those who can only destroy the body. I can't fear, shouldn't fear those who can't touch the soul. That's Jesus. And as you're inside, what you, you, you should you be, you be praying, God, strike them with blindness. <laughs> Bring utter confusion to them. Etc. Am I supposed to be doing that? No. What did Paul say? Are you with me? It's pretty simple. Bless them. Call the blessing of God down upon them. You know how hard that is to do? But that's maturity. It's to call God's blessing down upon them. That's exactly what Paul says to do. Where did he get this idea? Well, he got it from Jesus, who says in the book of Luke, chapter 6, his first sermon, Jesus says, verse 28, bless those who do what? Curse you. And by the way, pray for those who mistreat you. Bless them who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, I've told you, uh, I have to use my six years of Greek in grad school somewhere. So the New Testament was written in Greek. We need to analyze it because the inspired words are quite important as to what they picked. So I've told you before, if you take a verb and you wed a preposition to it, what does it do to said word? What does it do? It intensifies the meaning of the word. So what, what Paul does is, and, and what Jesus does, and Paul's done it all throughout this passage, and Jesus did it even when he preached, he takes, takes the word for calling a curse down on somebody, and he prep, sticks the preposition, kata, which means to be against something, and he, he weds that to the word. So he says if somebody is extremely, ultimately vile, venomous, I mean a terrible person, that if they're that way toward you with the faith, what does Jesus say? If they're one who curses you, he says, well, you should bless them in return. And I was reading an article the other day that uh, showed a bunch of witches uh, looking at the next election cycle and they are doing what? Uh, did you read this? They're getting together to bring curses down on the president of the United States. I don't care who the president is. That you should not be doing. But this is why we should pray for whoever's in office. Because there's forces of evil at the highest levels who are bringing curses down upon our, our leaders, no matter who's in office. And what should we be doing? Well, we should be in those situations blessing those who curse. They literally curse. And they're calling, as I read the article this week, for the minions of darkness to overtake his presidency. I'm like, huh? Unbelievable. Unbelievable the world in which we live. Jesus says, uh, when you're opposed, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Uh, think about Jesus uh, in his day and time when they arrested him. Uh, he, he's brought up on trumped up charges in a, in a, in a kangaroo court. It uh, uh, doesn't have evidence to convict him. Uh, and still the, the, the crowd, when Pilate asked them, who do you want me to release? I release one prisoner per, per cycle of executions like this per year. Which one do you want me to release? Barabbas, the insurrectionist who hates the Roman Empire, is a murderer from the get-go. Him or Jesus, they scream, Barabbas. We want the murderer. See, the world is always picking the wrong guy. They say they should have been picking the right guy over here who's for truth and morality, but they pick Barabbas. And then as they gather around Jesus, as they crucify him, they're chanting on his way up to the cross, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus looking down from the cross after the executioner, uh, nailed him to the cross and they put it in the hole and they raised the cross up and the people are mocking him. In Luke 23 verse 34, Jesus says this from the cross against those people who are mocking him. Father, forgive them. Why? They don't have a clue as to who I am. I'm filling in the details and what they are doing. They are so sold on their political theological position. They're going to kill God himself on a cross. They're going to nail the Son of God to a cross. They are so lost. What did he just do? He just blessed those who were cursing him as they crucified him. If you don't think that you can do that, yes, you can. Because Jesus set the, the tone of how to do that by blessing them as they crucified him. He asked for blessing in the form of forgiveness to fall on them. He could have called legions of angels to deliver him from the cross. 
He could have looked down from the cross and said, if you do not stop that mocking, sneering thing, I'm going to vaporize all of you. You know what I mean? He could have done all of that. He could have said in Hebrew, the worst thing that can happen to you in Hebrew is found in Genesis chapter 1, that when the earth was waste and void, it's called in Hebrew, tohu vabohu. It means the deconstruction of your, at, your atomic structure. Ultimate chaos. He could have said to the Jews, I'm going to tohu vabohu you. He didn't do that. What did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. They're spiritually blind, haven't any idea what they're doing. What are we supposed to do? Do the same thing. How, what happens if they don't respond positively? Do it anyway. How they respond to Jesus when he said, forgive them from the cross. Verse 20, um, ver chapter 23, verse 34 of Luke says, as they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves, the soldiers, and, and the people stood by looking on and even the rulers were sneering at him saying, quote, he saved others, let him save himself if he's the Christ uh, of God, the chosen one. And it says the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying it to his face after they crucified him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Come on, buddy. We've crucified lots of people here. No one's ever escaped. If you're God, get down. And he had just looked at those, those soldiers and said what to them? Father, forgive that crucifixion detail. They have no idea the son of God's hanging on the tree for their sin. See, when Jesus says, bless those who curse you, he totally means what he says because he lived that way. When you look at uh, Paul, Paul understood the words of Jesus and applied them even in his day because when Paul says, uh, bless those who persecute you, the persecution verb is a present active nature verb, which means the church in Rome was being persecuted. They were being persecuted by the Roman society because the Roman society, if you think about it, was very polytheistic. I mean, they worshiped a plethora of gods, did they not? Jupiter, Minerva, Venus, etc., Janus, etc. That was their pantheon of God. And all of a sudden, your daughter gets saved at some kind of Christian meeting, and she comes home to tell you, those are all false God. There's only one true God. Jesus is Lord. And there are no other lords other than Jesus. See, that began to be a problem in the, the Roman church who took an absolutist position of who Jesus is. But remember, if there was a resurrection of the man who hung on the cross, that changes everything. And so the church was born out of the resurrection of Christ. And when the church letter was written to the Romans, was a, as you remember, when we started Romans a couple of years ago, uh, it was around 56 to 57 AD. If you study political history, that's the exact time when Nero took the throne. What kind of leader was he? Crazy. Murderous. He would form, uh, to get rid of his senatorial opponents, he would form special judicial uh, trials. Uh, where he would uh, bring his opponents before him in trials that were secret to then bring them up on trumped up charges so he could eliminate his opponents and he did. And they hated him for it. They hated Nero. And then Nero was then blamed for the burning down of uh, basically Rome when the fire broke out. Uh, and nobody, you can read all the historical books, everybody debates who, who set the fire. Crazy Nero or his senatorial opponents uh, there's evidence that goes both ways. But after the fire half near burned down Rome, after it burned down Circus Maximus, um, he blamed who? Christians. They're the problem. They're the, the scapegoat. They're the issue. He then lit Rome up by putting them on stakes and ignited them. And in that environment, Paul tells the Roman Christians, when you're persecuted for your faith, you're to do what? You're supposed to... You're supposed to do what? Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. And then he says, don't curse. Bless them, positive. Don't curse, negative. When you take the negative uh, particle, not, uh, and you wed it to a present tense verb like this, this imperatival concept, it forbids an action in progress. There's another combination of negative uh, commands you could put together in Greek, which means stop something before, it, or don't do something before it even begins. He uses the present tense command form uh, with this negative to tell you they were guilty of doing this. They were guilty of going tit for tat, word for word, etc. He says, when it comes down to how you should live before the godless world, do not go toe to toe with them. Peter put it this way later, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. He says, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but 
giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. First Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9. You're not to return evil for evil, word for word, cuss word for cuss word, etc. Not supposed to do that. If my opponent mocks me, am I supposed to mock in return? No. Am I supposed to call them names, use pejorative terms to put them down? No. A pejorative term, by the way, is not an argument, is it? No. So does this mean I'm not supposed to fill, fulfill 1 Timothy 3, 15, which says I'm always to be ready to give a defense, an apologia of the faith? Does it mean I can't give a defense of the faith? No. I can totally give a defense of the faith, but it depends on how I do it. My tone, the words I use. Do I present arguments for the existence of God? Do I present arguments for the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ? Do I give them simple arguments with a loving tone? Or do I tack on verbiage and words to, to put them down? He says, don't, don't do that. He says, do not be guilty of cursing in return. I have a simple question. How are you doing with that one? How are you doing with that one? Uh, when I was on the Temple Mount, uh, well, I was on the Mount of Olives years ago, went right after 9-11, I went. Tourism was down, shockingly, 75%. And I went, and there was no one in Israel. Uh, and I was on the Mount of Olives, and there was a, a group of Islamic radicals gathered around our bus when we got off, uh, yelling and screaming at us. And I got off with the older ladies to make sure they were okay. And a guy came right over to me and started screaming in my face. I mean, chest to chest, eyeball to eyeball. I don't know him. My first day, first time ever on the Mount of Olives. And this is what happened to me. He's yelling and screaming at me in his broken English. I hate you. I hate your country. I hate, it's just going on. I'm thinking to myself, I took four years of German. I think they like Germans. So I asked him in German if he had a problem with me. And he just walked away. I'm like, Auf Wiedersehen. That was awesome. Maybe if you're in a situation, try another language. You know, <laughs> that would, saved me that day. You know, it's like, how do I engage this guy? I mean, he doesn't even really know English. So I'll, maybe he knows German. He knew German. It was interesting. But, uh, you know, persecution can come in many different ways. And you may not be seeking it, but you might think to yourself, you know, I just live under the radar. I don't let anybody know I'm really saved. I'm really quiet. You know, I don't want to bother anybody. Are you serious? Because what did Paul say uh, to Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Notice what he says, and it's so inclusive. And indeed, you can bank on this, some who desire to live a godly life might be persecuted. <laughs> Is that what he said? You, it's your first Sunday. This guy can't read. Yeah, it, well, yeah, that's what I'd be reading if my glasses were off, but my glasses are on. So all indeed who desire to live a godly in Christ, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted by your mother, your father, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, family gatherings, retreats, your job, next cubicle over, guys in the car you're, you're slugging with, and on and on it goes, your commanding officer, etc. You'll be persecuted. Why? Well, because they can't stand your faith. They can't stand what you believe. Like, what are they upset about? I'll give you a list to think about, and we'll close with these. What, why will they persecute you? Uh, number one, they believe that man is the answer to man's problems. That if Christianity would just get out of, way, out of the way, they could solve all their problems. There's a problem with that. Because back in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21, Paul says, you've inherited the sin of Adam. You're a sinner in need of a savior. So you're a problem to them because you're telling them you're not the answer. Christ is the answer. You need him. It's not the other way around. They'll, they will oppose you because they want to take the dystopian nature of our culture and make it utopian by you getting out of the way with your belief that Jesus is the answer, which leads to my second point. They will oppose you, the open-minded, tolerant in our culture, which are really not open-minded and tolerant, because you actually believe that one man who died 2,000 years ago on a cross is a solution to all set issues. And he is, because the evidence shows that he came and he died and he rose again. That changes everything. But they will persecute you for holding that position, which leads to my third point. If you're not a Christian, but you're in other, some other belief system, you will oppose that belief system because I absolutely believe in it. You will persecute the Christian for absolutely believing that Jesus was the Messiah who came to earth to die for our sins. Well, what about being open-minded about all the other religions? What did Jesus say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life, no man I don't care who you are. No man comes to the Father but through me. Is, it, is the gospel narrow? Oh yeah, it's very narrow. 
the path to destruction is very broad. But they will persecute you for not being open-minded to all other faiths. doesn't mean that I can't respect people of other faiths, but they're not absolutely true because they've rejected the Christ. Uh, the Bible Museum is awesome downtown. I don't know if you've, you've been, uh, but it's problematic to some people who aren't of faith. Uh, Joel Baden, a Yale University professor of Hebrew, said this recently. He says, there are a number of prominent omissions uh, that make at this museum that make it clear that it's not a museum about the Bible as one might expect it from a secular perspective. He says, they don't, go, they don't do a good job about talking about whether parts of the Bible are historically accurate because he thinks they're inaccurate. And then he doesn't like the fact that the museum doesn't talk about Islam, Mormonism, and other religions. Huh? I don't know. I'm just a logical thinking guy. I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading his article of his hatred toward the Bible Museum. I'm thinking to myself, if they built something downtown called like the Quranic Center to elevate the Quran, would I expect the Torah to be in there? What say you? No. Because our scriptures are based on the Torah, the prophets, etc. Uh, and so, you know, let them have their so-called holy book. But if they put, you know, the, the, the doctrines and covenants there of the Mormons or the Book of Mormon or whatever, would I expect, you know, no. Because those are their holy books. And so he, he's saying, because it's not inclusive of all these other faiths, we can't trust it. I think you need to go to the Bible Museum and understand you can trust the text. But he doesn't like the text. So he persecutes those verbally by writing articles about how close-minded the Christians are. Uh, they will uh, persecute you for loving morality that has absolutes tied to it. Because, you know, now that absolutes are unhinged when it comes to morality and sexuality, anything's possible. Nothing's perversion anymore. How dare you stand up for uh, a, a, there is only a man and a woman in a viable relationship in marriage before God and no other combinations. Uh, you'll get persecuted for that. Uh, you get persecuted, by, uh, lastly, by a scientist who loves scientism, who thinks science has the answer. Uh, Dawkins once remarked this. And notice, super educated man, here's what he said about well, faith. He says, do we know of any example where stupid ideas have been known to spread like an epidemic? epidemic? Yes, by God. It's religion. He says, religious ideas are irrational. Rash religious beliefs are dumb, dumber, and super dumb. I kid you not, he said that. I have the quote. I'm reading this thing to myself. What's his degree in? What? What? How educated is the man? And he comes up with a monosyllabic pejorative term to talk about a Christian. What did he call you? Dumb. You're just dumb. You're super dumb. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think so. Was Blaise Pascal super dumb? You said he is? No, I'm praying for you. Yeah, yeah. No, he wasn't super dumb. He was extremely intelligent. Pick all the great mathematicians, the, you know, the astrophysicists, etc., that, that followed the living God and founded most of the stuff that we have today. Super intelligent men and women. And he's calling them dumb. No, no, they were smart. But he will persecute them because from his parameter, if you don't buy into his evolutionary model, you're dumb. No, he needs to switch belief systems. Christopher Hitchens, uh, who's now deceased uh, and had his moment standing before God, wrote a book called God is not great, subtitled, How Religion Poisons Everything. I don't know if you've ever studied the historicity of atheism, but, but apply it to a culture and you will readily find out more people have been murdered by atheistic belief systems than anything. But he won't look at those facts. But now he's met God face to face, so those questions have been answered. When somebody opposes you for your faith, how will you, and not when would they do, uh, or if they do, but when, when they do, how are you going to respond? That's, it's a big question. How should you respond? I should bless them, call for God's blessing on them, and I should not curse them. We had an ethics uh, uh, discussion this week here at the church where we invited the community to come in. We had a, a lady from the FRC come, Family Research Camp, Council, uh, and Elizabeth Schultz, who's on the school board, to come talk to us, educate our children in the community about transgenderism how vile that is, and it's shocking what they're doing to your children. So we had a huge, the place was packed, the student center was packed, and I was the moderator for this thing. We'd never done anything like this before, and they told me when it started that there's an individual sitting on the second row, second seat, who's a blogger who's vile, who hates basically the Christian position. <coughs> I'm sitting on the row thinking, what's my sermon about? <laughs> Bless those. So I'm sitting on the aisle thinking, should I be afraid of him? No. 
but I know what I should do. I should pray for him. So before the thing ever started, I sat on the front row, and I, I don't even know the guy's name. I don't know him, but I prayed for him, that whatever he heard that night would be a pebble in his shoe, and that God's spirit would, would, would take these words and cut through the hardness, whatever it is, and get his attention with the gospel of Christ, because that's who he needs. That's who he needs. Bless those. Bless those who curse you, even if it's a bad Yelp listing, even if it's a bad Facebook posting. Bless them. That's spirituality. Let's pray. God, we thank you just for, wow, just how clear you are regarding how we are to behave. We struggle sometimes. We got to admit it. In family settings, really tough uh, when we're opposed for our faith and belief in you. But give us the inner strength, the courage, the love, the compassion to stand up and bless those. Call down your blessing upon their lives for they totally need you. Might we be those kind of Christians in this church? Amen.